Not Your Mother's Radio is listener funded. If you wish to assist and help keep the station active, funds can be sent via PayPal to Elliot. Is. Not. Your. Mother. At. Gmail.com. Remember, there is one L in Elliot. Thank you for your assistance. It is appreciated. Fred Muller was born August 26, 1956 in, in New York. He moved to San Francisco where his father was stationed in the Navy. Fred grew up in the neighborhood of Eureka Valley in the center of San Francisco, with a cast of characters. His drinking started at age 12 and drugs started at age 13. He moved to New York at the age of 20 and the drinking and, and drugs just excelled with a life of crimes and cons. Muller returned to San Francisco at the age of 35, and he stopped criminal activity, but not the drinking and drugging. In 1999 his daughter was born and he gained full custody of her in 2005 and he is now a full-time parent. Seven years later Fred surrendered to alcohol and drugs and it was, of course, the best decision he ever made. That day was December 27, 2012. Muller got married for the first time at the age of 60 and is now a successful self-taught abstract artist and a very happy family man. So please join Jim McCarthy and Elliot Goldstein as they have a friendly chat with Fred. Fred is very open and discusses his esoteric life. Enjoyed the show. Uh, uh huh. They're supposed to be hear you now. Feedback and stuff, but I don't know if they have or not. Okay. Well, let me take over a bit. Yeah. So, um, so, so, Fred, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. It'll clearer than Jim, right? Yes, clearer than Jim. Okay, great. Okay, cool. So, yes, in and out. Um, let's see. Let's take pick up where you left off, and well, we'll continue. Where was I? <laughs> um, oh, just like that. In our group, in our group, like was a pecking order, like you know, yeah. where you stood at the where you stood at in the park, you know, amongst your peers. You know, one kid was tougher than the other, uh-huh. but when we always stuck together, right? No matter what the circumstances were, where, where we're at, we always stuck together. And whether at Eddie's age, my age, or somebody younger, you just knew that you didn't mess with anybody if you came to this park. Right. That's how it worked. Okay, so it was actually a West Side Story. So to speak, I guess you could say, yes, yeah, yes. Without the, <laughs> without the ballet. <laughs> <laughs> that was later down the life. <laughs> yeah, okay. Then the gay, then the, gay community, the gay community came in yeah. 1972. Yeah. And that's when things started to shift again. Okay. You know, uh, that the first day, the first, yeah, excuse me, 1971, the first gay bar was, well, there was one in the 60s, but it wasn't on Castro on the main street. It was called Missouri Mule, and that was down on Market Street. Okay. And that was probably about six blocks away from the park, but when the gay scene really exploded, it was on, right in the, in the, in, by the park. I mean, the Pendulum, that was 1971, that was the first gay bar. And the more gay bars it was, is that the um, people of, of, of straight people were selling out their yeah. homes and moving north to get out of the city. Really? So the gay population actually did did, did fix the neighborhood up. Right. Because, I mean, you had two men or two women, and that they had uh, double jobs. Everybody had a job. You know, it wasn't mom and dad where the dad went to work. Yeah. They had money to invest in the building. Right, and right. And they did quite a good job. And very few kids. That, that, very few kids, but now the kids are coming back now. Right. I was just over that area last month, and now it's big, the, the more families are coming back right, right, that right. neighborhood. But it's so expensive here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 um, when, when you do get those, when you get a gay community, there's um, a lot of uh, disposable income. Yes. And um, yeah, because it's very yes. yeah, yeah, and um, um, and. And I know in you know Albuquerque and uh, Santa Fe that the uh, gay communities tend to be um, very very artistic and um, you know very very colorful and it brings a whole new flavor to to, to the city and um, you know you know a lot of people aren't used to that but um, you know it's definitely definitely a different scene. Yeah, we had to get used to that when we were younger, like the gay scene, yeah. you know, or like sort of speak homophobic. Right. At that time, you know, yep. in the 60s, you, 
you wasn't like, oh, no, they're in the neighborhood, the neighborhood. but they're actual people. Now, when I look back yeah. at that time, it was like, you know, no, 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 no. And, and what happened was we started robbing them. Okay. You know, and they carried a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. We they yeah. carried a lot of money. Right. You know, and uh, that's how most of us, instead of getting paper routes, getting up in the morning, we just go out in the evening wow. and, and rob some, some uh, a gay guy, wow. whoever was out there. Uh-huh. You well, know, they, 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 it was a trip. Yeah. Wow. They must have felt quite, they must have felt very, uh, very vulnerable at that time, the beginning times, I guess, with. Yes, in the beginning, they, they're very vulnerable, but then, you know, they started to um, group together now. You know, mm-hmm. they, they, they ran in packs now. They didn't run like two at a time, you know, walking with Ketchum. But then now they had this program with whistles. Oh, wow. They had whistles they blow if they're ever in, 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 in fear of anybody jumping them. Mm-hmm. But uh, that didn't work out so much for them anyways. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> what'd you like, do? Uh, what'd you do? Like, Steal? You stole the whistles? Well, no, they got Harvey Milk, who was assassinated here. Yeah, sure. And his boyfriend, I beat the hell out of him because they're trying to blow the whistle. And oh, every wow. time I used to see him on TV, I would laugh. I mean, now that I'm older now, but I'd be like, man, that guy was a politician now? You know, uh-huh. he, was just, he wasn't into politics at that time. Wow. When, when, when I grew up, when I snatched him up. Wow. But yeah, it, it was pretty a trip. And he had a lot of power. And in this city now, the gay population carries the vote. In this city, yeah, yeah, it has for a while. Um, yeah. Jim, Jim, are you familiar with Harvey Milk? Yeah, I've seen the film. With, oh, okay, uh, okay. On Sean Penn, uh-huh. and I also love ballet, and I love ballet as well. Uh huh. So you, I'm in touch with my feminine side, you know. I understand much <laughs> more than much more than Fred is. Um, Fred, you you came from a fairly dysfunctional family, then a lot of. Uh, Emotional and physical abuse at home, and also yeah. alcohol, alcoholism in the family. Mum and dad, I believe. Yeah, rampant, rampant, rampant. Mm. Uncles, parents, everybody. That was the thing in the sixties. Like, you know, when you got home, you told your wife to make me a highball, or you slapped him around. You know, and that's what you had to contend with. It's like your father is going to come home drunk, is going to hate your mother, and then your mother's going to, you know, be mad, and she's going to start drinking and. It was just, it was sad. And that's why we hung at the park, just to get away from that. You didn't want to be home. Nobody wanted to be home. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there was like one family that was somewhat stable that you could go to their house where they actually had a mother and father that actually cared. See, what happened wow. here is that father and service, they, they, my mom had to work. My dad was never a home. So we, I ran rampant. I, I did anything I wanted. You know, mm-hmm. I, I had no rules, no boundaries, no nothing. And I tested them all the time. You know, in and out of juvenile hall, log cabin, and it just escalated and escalated and escalated. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't, I look back and, you know, I had great times, but when I really look back now, it's like, boy, I don't know how I survived. I really don't. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And then so be with what Albert Dean's back. What kind of um, drugs were you getting? Say that again? Mm-hmm. What? What kind of drugs were you uh, able to obtain at that what time? What kind of drugs were, were around at that time? Oh, at that time, what, my younger days was psilocybin mushrooms, acid, uh, bennies, reds, like all the downers. Not too much coke. That was later on. But it, it, yeah, it was just all downers, quaaludes. And, and, and they're in abundance. So you could go anywhere and get them. They right. were everywhere. So it was heavy duty uh, stuff. It, it wasn't like weed or anything. You you really into heavy duty stuff? Oh uh, yes, yeah, very heavy duty because you wanted to block out what was really hurting you, but you didn't want to show that you were hurting. You wanted to be the tough guy, but you were actually taking these drugs so that you didn't feel anything. Right. You know, you were terrified to go home. So yeah. Sometimes I didn't even go home. Well, I, I came from a, um, mm. I, I I came from um, pretty much what you call a normal middle class. Uh, family. I lived on Long Island, and um, mm-hmm. I, I had a friend who was. Um, um, his parents were alcoholics, and he he used to tell me he he when his father came home at night he'd hide under the bed. He never knew what kind of a uh, you know mood he'd be in if he was going to be getting a beating that night. And this this guy grew up to be a tough guy. He was a collector for um, you know for bookies and stuff in New York, and he said that you know he got. 
you know, he got the crap beat out of him a good three, four times a week. And, um, you know, he just uh, was never able to do well in school. He, ne- he couldn't concentrate. He was always afraid that, you know, his ass was on the line. And um, it sounds like you kind of had the same type of uh, environment. That, that same feeling. I, that, that, that's, I, I know exactly where he's coming from, exactly where he's coming from. You got home, you didn't know what, you know, after that hide my brother and sister, the two older sisters and brother already moved on 18, but I had a twin sister and a younger brother who OD'd in 96, but I really think it was due to my father telling him he wished he never had him. And I think that, that, that killed him. I really do. I think that's when he got heavy the drugs. But like you said, when, um, father was home, you were afraid to go home because you didn't know what kind of condition he was in or how he was going to be. I mean, he used to make me stand at attention in my underwear in the kitchen slapping me and I wasn't allowed to cry so I Jeez. brought that out to the street where you're, you're not going to make me cry there, yeah. no, my father was 6 foot 8 320 pounds wow. he, I mean he picked me up by my head by his hand and if I thought if I could take a beating from him or a slap around him there's no kid that's going to slap me around that hard yeah. so what could you possibly do to me I was not I was, I was not fearful it's like bring it on Yeah. and then you know you just, you just learned and learned and but it got old. It got old. Yes. You know, and then um, let's see, he, he, he died in 79. And to be actually, I mean, it's sad to say, I, I was glad that he had died at that time. Right. I mean, I forgave him not too long ago uh-huh. because he was such an alcoholic he didn't know. But I hold a lot of resentment for, oh, for years. Right. Years. I mean, since he died, this years. And, and when you were. just got over it. And when you were a little kid, you really have nobody to help you. You know, you, you're on your own. And. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. And yeah, your mother didn't say anything. Your brothers and sisters said anything because they knew they were next. Right. What was, was your mom problem. doing? What was your mom doing through all this, Fred? Was she just a bystander watching all the? Just shit? bystander, yelling, screaming, leave him alone. But he didn't, he wasn't leaving you alone. He was a big man. There was nothing stopping this man. Right. And you know, he, he, she didn't divorce him because he was. Uh, we had a medical. Uh, a medical from the, the Navy, United States Navy. Mm-hmm. So she wouldn't give that up. No matter what torture she went through, she always makes sure that we and we needed the medical. I mean, I, I he sent me to the hospital a couple of times, yeah. but in them days he, he didn't say, you know, uh, my my husband beat my my son up. You didn't say that. You fell. It was yeah. all lies. You know, you, yeah, yeah. You, you, you don't want to be that bad stigma. You know, you just right. had to take it. You weren't allowed to open your mouth either. That stayed home. You don't wash it. You wash your laundry out in the open. Right, right, that right. Was, right. I was told that that and if you did it wasn't good right because you didn't know when he was coming mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. was the sad part wow as the, as the 60s moved on fred and you got into the kind of middle of the 60s you must have obviously been around when all the so-called san franciscan psychedelic flower scenes started happening i hate all that kind of Bullshit. Yes, I mean, you had the you, like Janice Joplin. That, that was just downtown from you, wasn't it? Yeah, but you had, you had Janice Joplin over by Noe Valley, which was over the hill from where we lived. We had Sly Stone on Twenty Second Guerrero. Who else we have? And we had quite a few. Um, the Doobie Brothers were up in Diamond Heights. It's a very small city, but everybody knows everybody. I mean, everybody knows if you lived there and you're some sort of entertainer or something like that, you knew where they lived, but you, you left them alone. It's not mm. like in New York, you follow them and follow them, follow them. They were just part of the neighborhood, you know, mm. and they're just like one of you. There's nothing special about them. Like Albert, I mean, he had a lot of fame, but there was, but he was just a regular guy, you know, you didn't know bow down to him now, but he was just funny. He, he, was, he had a lot of fun with that guy and all these mm. other people, you know, but that's the scene it was like in the sixties, mid seventies or the beginning of the seventies mm. was, was those, those times. Like the Doobie well, Brothers. As, as you've mentioned him, let's talk about Albert. For the people I've already done, and um, Elliot and I have done some Latin musicians based in the Bay Area, John Santos and Carl Parazzo, but people may or may not know who like Latin music and the Santana Bay Area scene that Alberto Gianquento was a Sicilian pianist who lived in Eureka Valley that you guys knew. He was responsible for arranging the first Santana record, I think on the on the advice of Bill Graham to the group. I believe they were so. Doing 40 minute jams or whatever. And mm-hmm. then he 
he co-wrote Incident and Nishjabur on the second record of Braxis, which the song is about a skirmish or a battle between Toussaint Louverture, the Haitian revolutionary and the French forces. But going back to Albert, again, Albert's one of these kind of real street people that um, oh, he was, he, he circulated was around Santana. Tell us about he, him. He was really the street. The guy was so multi-talented. It, it was a shame that he was a dry heroin addict. He could do mm. anything. This guy could throw a football, I mean, on both hands, 60 yards. He could bounce a basketball off the wall into the hoop. What else? I mean, the guy played piano and couldn't read it in notes. Uh, we had this auditorium. We had this auditorium at the park, and he'd come and play for us, and he'd bring some woman, right? And he'd get her on the stage, and he'd jump down and play the piano, and then he'd go, okay, when I tell you to open the curtain, you know, so he'd stop playing and run up, up there, and he goes, hey, open the curtain, and he's blasted her from behind. <laughs> And then he goes, close the curtain. Then he'd run down and he'd jam on the piano again. And you act like, act, act like a concert. I mean, he was that good. I mean, he was just so multi talented. He could talk your pants off you. You know, he was just that good con. He had, he had it going on. Like, I remember one of his uh, favorite sayings was, because he loved going to Chicago and those Blackstone Rangers then, back there with the black, uh, back the black gorilla family. And one of his favorite sayings was, I'm a Blackstone Ranger, Spanish Cobra. Street corner bus stop, pavement macaroni. I went to college, that college of concrete and got a degree in pavement. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, Eddie, Eddie, you, Eddie and you, you knew Alberto quite well. He was from a Sicilian family that lived in the neighborhood. He had a brother who was much more kind of straight laced than Alberto. But yes. I mean, from what I've heard from various other people, like Alberto became very, I suppose what we'd call now, he became quite radicalized politically. And he used to, apparently he used to have a suitcase full of guns, machine guns. Well, no, he had a, um, he had a, a, a machine gun, a, 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 in, a, in a violin case. And once in a while he'd get dressed up like with a gangster with the fedora and everything. And he'd walk down the street. Then we'd take the car out to the beach and just shoot up the beach with this machine gun. You know, it was a semi-automatic. And he'd put it back in the case and he'd tighten up his, his tie and shit. <laughs> it was, it was really funny. You know, we never got caught by the police, you know. I mean, I'm surprised. Um, mm. it, it, the cops did know Albert. They knew him and they knew who he was in the neighborhood and they left him alone. It was kind of mm. funny. It was like I that. Heard I, he that was, I heard he was going to be the possibility he was going to be a major league Baseball player before. Yes, he, he, he played for the St. Louis Cardinals farm team. Uh, it's a, a semi pro ball. He played for them for a while. I mean, that's what I'm saying. This, this guy, he can't catch balls under his legs, behind his back. I mean, the ball's hit off the center field. He's running backwards and he catches it from behind. Not like a normal person. He always did something extravagant. It was always mm. better, you know, and he's always tested the waters and he was always good at it, no matter what it was. He could do mm. it. That was the funny thing about it. You know, mm -hmm. he could be, um, like, up, say, um, like another time, and you couldn't do this now. Like, he'd get his royalty checks and he'd go down the bank with goggles on and a woman's <laughs> uh, swim hat and walk into the bank. And before you think somebody was holding up, we'd walk <laughs> in there. I remember he had a check for 25600 and he got $25,000 in $100 bills. And then he asked the person to get the teller to six hundred dollars in fives, and then he'd go outside and throw it in the air to watch people run around, and then we'd go to LA. We'd go to LA for dinner, but you always made sure you got your ticket from Albert, or he'd leave you there. <laughs> Fred, yes. with Albert, did you, were you aware that he was working with the Santana Group? Or? Yeah, but at that time he was a loader. It was it was nice that you knew him, you know, the that, but. He was just one of the guys. You really didn't look at it that way. You know, if you were on the outside of like yourself looking at him, oh, it's Albert John Cohen or Braxis, Incident Nashabar. We didn't see him as that. We saw him as Albert. Albert mm -hmm. John Cohen. That's how we saw him. And, you know, he could be money one week and then broke the next week. You know, and his favorite line was, you got a deuce I could borrow? <laughs> <laughs> and he just had 25 grand last week. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. 
he he would ask for like he did have twenty five thousand dollars the week before, and the <laughs> following week he would be broke and he'd ask it for a deuce, I mean a couple bucks, so he'd get himself a, a bottle of wine. Nice, <laughs> nice. But were was, you aware? Were you aware, Fred, of, of Albert getting into harder drugs like heroin? Were you aware? Oh, of oh yes, yes, yes. I mean, one time. We we're up at the field. It was a baseball field, and we hadn't seen Albert in a while. But we heard that he was in a hospital, for, you know, heroin. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, I, I believe it was a sunny afternoon. And we we're standing, the thing, and here comes Albert strutting across the. That's a painting behind me. That there. Yeah, that's, no, for a second. That's, that's a painting. Yeah, very cool. Very cool, Fred. Fred, I think we can, we can just cut it. What you said last time was he went out and got his dope or something. Did you? Was it something like that? Oh, that's when he fell out after he got to the hospital. He just uh, he uh, did a big shot and just fell out into the uh, into the field. And you know, we called the ambulance for him. But yeah, he was just that that, that the last time. And then then when, I left. Yeah, you left. Oh. Um, Eureka Valley around then, didn't you? Around that time? Yes, I, I left uh, January of 1980 to, to New York. Was that the last time you, just, just to finish off the Alberto thing, was that the last time you actually saw him? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, right. before, I, before I left, I saw him. But I, it, it, yeah, I saw him before I left. You know, mm. But that's the last I've heard of him and things like that until I came back. In the 90s, I held that he had died in 84, I believe. He was like 42 years old. Before we go to New York, I want to stop you because there is a story that you, um, that I know about that uh, was interesting from the point of view of what it really is like to be involved more in the drug scene at that time. And uh, there was something to do. Did you start selling co cocaine at that time or were you involved in the distribution? No, at that time the cocaine, I, I started that in, uh, I mean, we, I did a little petty stuff, but my, my cocaine distribution really accelerated in New York. That's when it okay. accelerated. I, I was doing kilos. Right. Was that, and the, does that relate to the Miami story? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, that, that, then all that's my coke dealings were out of Miami. Okay, then. Um, right. So you're roughly 20, 20 years old now, Fred, and you're going to New York, a new career in a new town. So um, you go, where do you go when you go there? What, what happens? Where do you go? Well, when I first moved out, I went to stay at my aunt's house. You know, they lived in the projects and that. My mother's sister, great family, you know. And I only stayed there two weeks, you know. I, I stayed with them and then I vanished. I mean, I didn't know anybody in New York. But I went into, from Staten Island, I went into Manhattan. I took the ferry over. And it was just that playground for me now. I'm like, I couldn't believe how large the city was. And I was there in that, and I met this woman. I was at this diner it's by uh, Madison Square Garden on 34th. And uh, she had asked me if I wanted to get high. And this woman, I, well, later I found out she was 38. But uh, she asked me to get high, and I told her, like, you know, are you a cop? And she goes, well, come outside and see. Well, when I came outside, she was in a nice Mercedes. You know, really nice clothes and that. I lived with her for six months. I never even checked in with my aunt again. I went back to Staten Island after six months, but she showed me all through New York, the Hamptons, Long Island, you know, Westchester. She was an architect, but oh, wow. she was a freak from the decks. You know, she lived up, up on the Upper East Side, and, you know, she had money because that's where you have doormen. You don't have them on the West Side, you have them on the East Side. So we had a, a great time. I mean, it was a great time. She showed me a lot, you know. I thought it was a man of the world when I left the park. This was even better. Hmm. And that time, were you doing, were you starting to do drugs again, or was she? Oh, uh, yes, know? yes. But when I went there, yes, I was doing cocaine, drinking. It was mostly cocaine and drinking. I got rid of, like, the 60s drugs, like the acid and all that. That kind of surfaced out. Uh, but now I was into the, into the cocaine. Mm -hmm. I was mostly into coke. I wasn't running into many other drugs. I just loved the coke because it could keep me up. It was a good high. You have some drinks. And it all worked out. You didn't lose control of yourself until later in life. But at that yeah. time, you, it was a good time, you know. Do you think and there, a, like, like a lot of addictions, do you think there was an initial 
good period where you're not just chasing the first hit you actually are kind of maintaining some kind of pleasure out of it and did did you also think it changed your personality fairly quickly or do you of course it changed my personality i mean i, I was at times i was paranoid at times i wasn't paranoid it, mm. I, I did i didn't know when that was going to happen but i was willing to take the risk you know mm -hmm. i could be happy 10 minutes and then i wanted to kill you next 10 minutes you know, it just you, you elevated your blood pressure, your thinking, yeah. your awareness of what's going on. You could hear pins dropping. It, it was really strange, mm -hmm. you know. But it got to the point where you, I, I, I needed it. You know, it was just non go, 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 go. Mm -hmm. You know, from robbing people, what's going down to Miami, coming back. I barely, really ever slept. You know, that's what it seemed like. It just wore me to the ground. So before that happened, you uh you met this woman and then did you get hold of a firearm at that stage or not at that stage i, I left her uh i just i was just her boy toy at this time and it got old you know so then you know i just started running through the streets and then later later in life i, I got the gun when i got out of rikers island How I, I, I got caught for shopping cars you know uh, uh placing picking up money for bookies running numbers, uh, things like that. My gun stuff is, is when I got out, I really didn't have a job and I needed money and I didn't want to borrow money. You can borrow I, help, money can I stop you there, Fred, for a second? Because sure. you're going through a lot of information very quickly, but there's a lot of interest there. Before you, okay. went, to, like, before you went to Rikers, you were doing shopping cars. Tell people, tell us what, what is shopping cars? What does it Shop involve? Yeah. Okay, a shopping cart is, you, I, I had a guy that still stole cards out of Manhattan, and mm -hmm. shopping cards is dismantling cards and selling the parts, which I used to do that on Long Island because it's a suburb. I was uh, like uh, Deer Park, Long Island, Babylon, Long Island. Um, I'd wait for a car to come at nighttime, but my thing was I would never disperse the parts. I'd cut the car up for you and leave it there, and that was my part. That was only my part. You had the guy that brought the car. He brought the car to me. I cut it up into pieces, whatever you wanted. And then there's a third partner who came and picked up the pieces and sold them. So I was more like the middleman. I didn't want to deal with anything outside that. But I mm -hmm. eventually got caught. I eventually got caught, you know, because we were doing too many cars. I can make anywhere, anywhere from ten to $15,000 one night. There's, then another, there's another form of that over here, Fred, where people used to get cars and actually kind of like, accident type things and kind of stick two shitty cars together and try and resell them on i don't they don't call it chopping cars i can't remember what they call it now. they're called salvage cars yeah yeah scam over Stop. here we kind of you'd have to be careful that you bought a car that was two fucking cars put together right? yeah they would uh steal the vins they would uh, take the old vins off the engine blocks and um and the cow yeah 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 tell us about loan sharking uh, right, you got involved in loan sharking and running numbers. First, tell us about loan sharking first. Who loan were you? Who were you? How did you get that? Who were you do, doing that with? Or I met for? this guy Mario. You no, know, he wasn't. He wasn't a made guy, but he knew a lot of people, and that's how I started to hang out with. And then mm -hmm. Joe Joe DeAngelis was another one. He's he's murdered now, but um, they turned me on to that. You know, you know we're gonna go collect some money. And these were pretty heavy hitters. And that kind of intrigued me, like, man, I'm stepping up on my game. But little did I know, it's getting worse. I thought it was real cool. I'm hanging with these guys, you know. It's like, mm -hmm. all right, but, you know, it's another game, you know. You're, you're damaging people's lives. But you know what? You, you want to borrow this money and play the game, there's a part to pay. And that if you don't pay, there's no, it's not like you're on the West Coast. They tend to forgive. Back East, they don't forgive. Where were you so shark? Where, 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 where were you sharking? Down in uh, 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 by Gramercy Park, by the old homestead, uh -huh. there was a bar down there. Uh, just all through that neighborhood. Yeah, because picking up money instead of collecting money. You know, I used to hang out in Dare Park. Uh, I knew a lot oh, of Long Island. Yeah, yeah, I knew a lot of bookies there. I knew a lot of uh, oh, what's his name? That guy, uh, Joey Budafuco, was uh, in Merrick. Yeah, Joey Budafuco. Yeah, he was out of Babylon. He, he had a car shop. Yeah, in Merrick. Oh, yeah, 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 I was living in Mer Bel I was living in in uh, uh, um, Baldwin at the time. Oh, you're in Nassau County. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I had friends in oh, Deer okay. Park, and my Deer Park friends 
were uh, collectors. And uh, do you remember the Massapequa were um, taxi cab company? Oh yeah, it's right by the the, the Massapequa thing was right by the uh, Long Island Railroad. Yeah, well They're the right guy by the, uh, by the Cozy Cabin. The Cozy I was Cabin at a Park. card game hanging out with some friends one night when a bookie won the entire um, cab company. Oh really? Yeah, and he, <laughs> he and he gave it to his wife as a gift. The guy's. Oh wow. Yeah, the guy passed away many years ago. His name was Whitey, and um, uh, yeah, and he was um, yeah. Whitey was a a, a big time operator on Long Island, and um, in fact, he was in World War II. He went over um, with Patton, and so oh, okay. and so he 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 was black market in in the army, and supposedly this is what he told me. I'm sure it's the truth that when he got uh, there, the French said. They, but the first thing they said was, Viva la French, where's Whitey? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't remember I reading, I, I saw the movie Patton, I, didn't, I don't remember seeing that in the movie, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there were some crazy people in Dare Park. That was part of the director's stuff. Yeah, that, 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 that's right, John McCarthy, Dare Park, right off of, uh, um, Sunrise, uh, Sunrise Highway. Sunrise High was 27 and 27A. Yeah. And then you had the, one that came, yeah, the LIE. Down, yeah, the LIE. What's the, that, what's the road that came straight down from Dix Hills? Uh, Dix Deer Hills. Deer Park Avenue. Deer Park Avenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a good place yeah, to straight run. Straight down from Northern Parkway. Northern Parkway all the way down to Yeah, Park. Yeah, and the LIE. To 231. Yep. Two, yeah, 231. Yep. I lived right off the Meadowbrook. I lived right off the Meadowbrook. Oh, okay. Okay. I lived off Northern Parkway at one time in Hawk Park. Uh-huh. Yeah, so that was my stomping grounds. I kind of grew up in that neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I still have friends up in Deer Park. And, um, you know, it was a crazy name. Wyand Dance was up there, a good place to get cars. It, yeah, actually, the Wyand Dance is the black neighborhood. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. Suffolk County. And Suffolk County. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so, so we, 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 we were hustling the same neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I did like Long Island. Yeah, I know, do. but it got more into your time to see one to the city. Uh -huh. But you know, you could get anything out of Long Island that you could get in the city. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if your friend Whitey, I mean, he, he knew a lot of people. And there were some heavy hitters up there. Yeah, there were. You know? You, you just had to know what, who you were dealing with, you know, just keep, mind your own business, as a matter of fact. And then like the, uh, the cozy cabin was right by them. By, and, then, by them and, and, and then you had the meth head uh, of motorcycle clubs up there. Pagans. 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 Yep, the Pagans. Pagans. Yep. Yeah, they hung out down in uh, Bayshore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bayshore. Yeah. Yep, same yeah. neighborhood. So, yeah. Cool. <laughs> yep. Right? Yeah. Fred, can you yes. just tell us a bit more about what loan sharking is? Now, what happened there? People would go to these guys. They weren't made men, but they were kind of part of that situation. Who was lending money from who? And the mob... What happened after that? The mob, the mob loans money out, or it, it, it to there's like different factions, and they loan the money out, right? Mm -hmm. And they, but it's a high percentage, and most of you can't pay it back, but you're desperate, and but we know we're coming after you, you know. You don't pay it back, you get your leg broke, your eyes poked out, whatever it took, or your hands broke, but you know what? You paid it back. I mean, I thank God I was never with them that actually got killed, but I'm sure that's happened. You know, that mm -hmm. has happened, but I was never part of that. But I've, I've been where some people took some beatings or gave a beating. Or, you know, when I was this guy with Mario, he goes, here's a bat, help us. And that's how I started. And, man, I never hit anybody with a bat, you know. Mm -hmm. And these guys would, like, just slug you out. Mm -hmm. they would, oh, you didn't feel anything. And that's what happened when I got into that. I started with the drugs and this happening here. I got mm -hmm. to be no feeling. No feeling whatsoever. It was mm -hmm. me or you. And mm -hmm. it, it didn't feel bad about it. You know? You're more like you got patted on the back for doing something like that. Yeah. You know, you were fear. What, what you were fear. Of, what kind of percentage uh, would they be putting on? Say a guy comes and what? 30 grand? 100 grand at 20% every week. You mean 20%? It goes up 20%, then 20%. Yep. Yeah. Every week, 20%. You don't pay it, it's another 20%. Don't pay it, it's another percentage. By that time, you're so far in, you want out, you want to die. And you're only paying, and, and you're only paying the interest, you're not even paying the principal. Right, exactly. That's what I'm saying. The 20% is going to pay. You're trying to get out of it. And 
what happens, you become to a dark place. Like I'm never, I'm playing the press, but I'm never, I'll never get out of it. So then you have this bright idea, like you're going to leave. We mm-hmm. find you, you find you because you always come back to the hood. You know, mm-hmm. you always come back. You might leave for six months, but you know what? When you catch it, you get the beating even worse now. But yeah. I spent some time with the Columbos. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, a buddy of mine was involved, and I used to hang out with him and, you know, go in for some laps and stuff. And I go to the Monday night meetings because, you know, Monday night, um, uh, uh, everybody, um, you know, that was the night everybody kind of collected. That was the night you, you, um, uh, you know, you paid, you, you know, you paid the guys off. You got the money to pay off the guys who won. And, um, so we used to go, like, to, to the meetings every Monday night. And it was pretty cool. You know, you're dealing with some heavy duty dudes and, um, you know, the whole thing was, uh, if you ran, you know where they found you 90% of the time? In Yankee Stadium. In the Yankee Stadium. Because 90% of these guys were Yankee fans and they would, <laughs> and they would, t- they would take off and they would disappear for months, but baseball came and they had to go to Yankee Stadium. So you'd have these wise guys <laughs> hanging out in Yankee Stadium just waiting for you to uh, show up and, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, wait for you to come across the bridge. Yeah, the yeah. Yeah, you know, and was, but they don't have baseball caps on. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, they didn't. And uh, yeah, it was the funniest thing. Yeah, what are you doing today? I'm going to Yankee Stadium. I'm sure I'll find somebody. <laughs> it was that kind of thing. It was. Yeah. There's plenty of fish out there. Yeah. Because no, you had the fish market out there too. Right. You know, Hunts, Hunts Point. Yeah. And that's right by Yankee Stadium. So you know, they used to they do the trucks. Yeah. I was, uh, hijacked the trucks at that. That was a big thing when I was there. Was hijacking trucks. Yeah, I'll tell you, you funny. Know. I'll tell you a funny story. I was telling this to a friend of mine. I'm I'm, I'm living in Freeport. Okay. And I get a knock Sorry, on the yeah. door, and a friend of mine comes in and gives me eighty pounds of pecans. <laughs> so I said, I, I said to him, "What the fuck am I going to do with all these pecans?" He said, "Listen, it's not my fault. We sent some guys out to hit an electronics truck, and they hit the wrong truck. We got pecans up the ass." <laughs> <laughs> So I'm still eating pecans 30 years later. <laughs> oh, you invested. Yeah, I invested. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I used to live, yeah, I, I lived in an apartment building on Merrick Road. You remember Merrick Road? Yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 in Freeport. And um, I gave yeah, everybody, way. everybody in the building got pecans for a month. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, okay, okay Jim. Elliot. Yeah. Elliot Elliot. Elliot. That was my, yeah, that was my nickname. Actually, yeah, they, so, actually my nickname was the my, my nickname was the Hebrew kid. Not the Hebrew kid, but I really had a nickname there. Yeah, that's what they used to call me in the club, you know, because you never used the real name. Hey, here's the Hebrew kid. <laughs> yeah, no, no one ever used the real name. That was the thing when I got out. That's what that I got used to when I moved to New York. I go, like, okay, I'll give you a quick story. I just went to go get. Uh, a TSA pass uh, to go to Europe because I was going to see Jimmy. I get a call from the FBI. This was last year. Now, I haven't been in New York in 30, 35 years, and this guy was talking about uh, uh, the Antlers. Somebody murdered him in 94. And what's my point here? And they followed. I mean, I went there. Oh, oh, that's what it was. So when we get to the FBI, he goes, do you know this guy? And I said, yeah. I, I, I go, but I haven't seen him in years. And, that, and he goes, well, what about his friends' names? And I said to him, you said, I go, look, you know as well as I do. In them days, nobody had a real name. It was a nickname. You yeah, know? Yeah. I, 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 no one had a real name. Yeah, I know. You know? What was, your, what was yours, Fred? Did like, you remember? Fast Freddy. Fast Freddy. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Freddy, I like that. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Everybody, yeah. Oh, it's like a of a crumb cartoon. But yeah. She never called anybody by the real name. No. Yeah, that yeah. was the beauty of it. That's how the police really couldn't catch it, who you actually were. And the guy, the, 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 the guy I answered to was Mickey Bats. Mickey Bats, exactly. Mickey Bats, yeah. <laughs> Did he you know play- all these guys, uh, Fred? Pardon me? Did you know all these guys that Elliot knew then, or? No, no, we have different factions. There's a, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a huge network in New York City. So oh, yeah. Remember, you got 17 million people here. You know, oh, yeah. so you, everybody's doing their own thing. And yeah. That's the thing about New York. You make your own money. You you don't want to work for somebody. You make your own. Whether you have body shop, yeah. no matter what it is, you work for yourself. Yep. You doing everything 
your parents want you to work for a corporation, but you know growing up and out there, you're going to be working for yourself, and you just hustle. Right. And when you hustle, you make money. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, Can I ask you a thing just to round out just that question, uh, Elliot, as well? Um, what about running? Tell us a bit about how it operates with running numbers. Tell us what you All you do, you do is I'm, I'm, I'm picking them up and dropping them off, picking them up and dropping them off. I go to okay. different bars, pick up the numbers, run them to the bookie, run them to the bookie. And they got to be there at a certain time, mm-hmm. you know, or to take the bets, take the bets, you know, but, you know, okay. that's how that works. Yeah. So you doing that at the same time as the sharking too, yeah? Or was that a Yeah, a little, 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 little after. Because I wanted to slow down my pace. I, it's getting to be a little too much. Hey, Fred. I mean, you're on call all the time. Fred, do you remember the, um, do you remember the football cards? Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Three, you win three, you win seven, yes. Yeah. The football cards were in every bar out there. Yep. So all you had to walk up and ask for them. Yep. You no, know, but the, the cards were very big. And there's another one there. See, like back east, you know, you paid the card. Or now you just get a beating. It's just that, that simple. It was so plain out there, out there with what I saw. You know, there was no bullshit. It's like back here on the West Coast. Not, out there was the real deal. You know, you followed the direction. Yeah. You didn't like think think yourself. I'll do this, but you weren't supposed to. But everything behind the law of, of street law, I should say, and you followed that, and you know that's how you respected. Right. Um, now I know that you ended up in Rikers after a while, but before mm. that, there was a story you told me that I think sort of in a way exemplifies and illustrates the kind of. The harshness, the hardness, and the the uh, the need to maintain face on the street. Now, you were you were going to Miami and getting coke and selling it. I know that you're probably involved with some Italian gentlemen down there in Miami. What was the Cubans. there was a link up to, to, there was a link up to you and some Latins. In, yeah, um, and Corona tell us Queens. Tell story about these guys and what happened. To uh, these. Corona Queens. There was a bar in Corona, and I used to do, deal them uh, coke, like two kilos and that. It was all Latin. I was the only white guy. But I had the good blow. But, uh, you know, I used to carry a gun and that. And this man, well, this guy, I should say, man, he owed me $17,000. And I went to go collect it. I went by myself with a gun, walked in, and he laughed. But he only laughed because his friends were there. And uh, he called me gringo and that. And I said, where's my seventeen grand?" And uh, he laughed about it. I said, I'll tell you what, man, I'll be right back in about an hour. And you better have my money. And uh, I can't remember sick. And I, but here, what you got to understand is you got to make a statement with people. You know, something outrageous that will like, take your breath away. But you got to, once you start, you got to go through with it. So I went down the street, probably about a mile away. Went out some drinks, had a little blow. I said, fuck it, I'll just stab him. So I walked back into the bar, and there he was. He was still sitting there, and he said to me, did you come back to shoot me? And I said, no. I said, I'm coming back here. I'm going to make sure you don't walk out of this bar. And he laughed. Well, after he laughed, I must have stabbed him about ten times in his legs while he was sitting down. Then I pushed him off the bar stool. Now I said, walk away, and he couldn't. But his friend gave me the money. His friend gave me the money. What happened there was, I left, I called back, I said, I want my money where I met the guy in Manhattan. But I watched him from a phone booth with binoculars because I knew after stabbing his friend, they're going to come for me. And I wasn't going back to that bar. So we uh, met, I think we, we meet at, it was by Madison Square Garden because I came in on the train. I think it was like 54th. And there was a phone booth there and I, I, I called the phone booth. He was there and I said, you know, just, I see, I want you to drop the money like this doorway. I said, I'm watching. I can tell what colors, you know, what you're wearing, what you're doing, how you're looking around. So, you know, don't do anything stupid. And he left me my money and that was the end of my deal with them. I never went back out there again, but I know his friend will always remember me. I shredded his legs. I mean, I, 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 he screamed and the pain, but this at the point in my life, like, that screaming didn't bother me. In the very beginning, when I first started getting into a move to New York, that would have bothered me a little. Now I come prone to it. It doesn't bother me because it's not me. But the thing is, he made the mistake, not me. You know, had he just paid it like he always did, 
always did, this would have never happened. But I'm not here to explain to you or, or tell you anything. I just, the name of the game is I want my money. And I will do anything to get my money because part of that money owed to a people down in, in, in Miami. Mm -hmm. A Cuban, a Cuban gang. It wasn't, it wasn't Italian, they were Cubans. But they had the best, oh. But now I gotta give him, I, I will have him half that money. So, you know, it's That's me the sentence if you don't as well, isn't it? Well, they're gonna kill me. But mm. you know this going in. That's the thing you gotta understand. You get in this game. It's not, it's not, um, everybody thinks it's funny games. It's not serious shit. And you, you pay your life for it. Like the guy, uh, like I'll tell you this story, like I told that story with the guy that came into the, the shootout at the hotel. It was on Queens Boulevard. Um, we're in there and, you know, we, we'd always, um, check a guy out for about a month. I'd follow you around because if you wanted two keys, that was a lot of money. And, you know, I'd want to make sure you weren't a cop. I'd find out like your, your, your kids went to school, where your wife worked, where you worked. I'd follow you around for a month before I'd deal with you. Because mm. then I would know, then I knew everything about you. Well, one time this guy came with his friend and I told my friend, this is not good. There's something wrong here. Something wrong here. We haven't checked this guy out. And sure enough, we get in there and I noticed when we're in the, in the hotel, motel, I should say, hotel. the door never, yeah, the door never closed. And you're very aware of these things, these little things. That Can you explain, explain that a bit further, Fred, what you mean there? Tell, you've kind of jumped over the detail there. What do you mean by that? The door never closed. What happened there? Oh, when he the came in the door, when he came in the door, we had the blow in that there. And the guy came in, he never shut the door behind him. Oh, right. Yeah. To me, he left the door open for, and by the time I thought about it, two guys came in and we had a shootout in, mm. in, in the, in, in the, in the room. And then we all grabbed a blow and we said we lost some, whatever, but everybody scampered, but you can't call the police. And, and I was running across the street and he shot me in the leg and knocked me down. And I remember that. I remember burnt like hell. And I knew I couldn't go to the, I couldn't go to the, the hospital because I got to call the police. So I dug that, it was like a 22. I, I dug that blood out of my leg. It went in my calf and came out by my ankle. But I, that's but small, I dug. That's a small ball bullet, isn't it, Fred? Because yeah. it's a small piece. It's not bulky, but it yeah. still kill you. It, it, it's, it's okay. the kind of choice to kill you up close because it's quiet and quick. Doesn't make a big bang. Mm -hmm. But, you know, after that, you know, I shot and I was like, man, I can't believe the guy shot me. But then I can't because I shouldn't be doing this shit, what I was doing. You know what I mean? It was all off for the money. <laughs> but I was very, very mad. And that's when I got out of that. That's when I no. got out of that. I was like, man, I had enough of that shit. Now, before you, um, was this roughly around the kind of time after the barroom standoff and getting your 17,000 back and paying those guys off? Did you pull out of that scene then? Was that your cue to yeah, get I out? Pull, I pulled out. I pulled out. I, I didn't want to do it anymore. It was too, it was too much traveling and just too much stress. You mm -hmm. know, you always got to be on the go. You know, you got to be aware of what's your surroundings and everything. Mm hmm. Did you, was this round about the time now you got caught for, uh, car chopping and an assault? Was this round about the time you went to Rikers or? Yeah, that, that's right around that time. And that's, yeah. that's Tell when us a I bit got about what that, That's a kind of famous prison that a lot of people talk about. Well, it's, 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 ten, it's ten buildings. It's ten buildings in the, in, in the, uh, East River. There's one little bridge that goes to it and one little bridge that comes off. But mm. what happens is it's, it's just all the people, everybody from New York City is very loud. And what it is, it's a city, a county jail, and you're not sentenced. So everybody's on edge because they don't know how much time they have. You know, some are sentenced and some are not, but the majority are not sentenced. So there's where you get the, the, a lot of, uh, of the intense fighting and, 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 and everybody's on edge and, you know, you don't think you're going to make it, but you got to be a survivor. Some survive, some don't. You know, you got to be willing to take a beating, you know, because if you don't, then they're just going to punk you. You know, and that's what you don't want because then you're everybody's action. As far as I mean, his action is I'm taking your cigarettes. I'm taking your food. I'm taking your tray when you get fed. You know, I, you more or less you're my bitch. And mm -hmm. that's how that pulls on. But in that, in, in that faction, the whites stick with the whites, the Latins stick with the Latins. And that's what becomes the racial thing in any kind of prison situation mm -hmm. or any jail situation. You have, that's the must. It's called politics. So I mean, yeah. 
But then, you know... Well, any you any allegiances you have with, say, black or Latino people outside, that's all gone in there, yeah? You have to stick with your own... Uh, no, you stick with your own. Yep, you yeah. stick with your own. Uh, that's how that works. Like, if I was standing there and you were there and I didn't know you and you were white and you were getting beat up, I'd have to jump in whether I knew you or not. Mm-hmm. Whether I knew you or not, you, you have to jump in to, to help your race. Mm-hmm. Tell me, um, tell us a bit more about so you got transferred to Rikers from the county jail there. Um, how long were you in there for, and how did you cope with it? How did you cope with that situation? I was in there, well, I was in there several times. One oh. time uh, for a year, well, one time six months, then a year, then 16 months, then two years. I've oh. done probably about, in Rikers, I had probably about four years altogether. But my two, 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 two and a half years is my longest stint Jeez. in Rikers Island. Okay. But you have to adapt. You, it's just like you, you adapt. You know, you test it just like any place else you go to. It's just mm. a harsher environment and you've got to be willing to give it your all. This, you don't go anything half-assed. You might get, you know, I've had my nose busted three times, mm. but I didn't back down. As long as you don't back down and give in, you pretty much keep to yourself. Like they have the saying, you never serve time, let time serve you. <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> And you make the best of it. Did you have time then? Sorry, pardon the pun. Did you have time while you're inside to uh, start thinking maybe I've made a wrong fork in the road here? Or do you know? No, I, mean? I was angry. No, no, I was ready to do more crime when I got out. Right. Okay. You know, I, I wasn't ready for, to, to call it quits. You know, mm-hmm. and that's right when I started robbing people at gunpoint. That's what I came into. Right, tell, tell us that, what you that came was at the of- very end. You came out of Rikers and then you, you, uh, you, you stayed in Ocean Boulevard for a while in Jersey, is that right? No, 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 that Ocean Boulevard's right. Miami. Uh, I'm no, sorry. I went over to, I went over to Jersey to hang out for, when I got up for like lay low for about a month and just mm-hmm. regroup, you know, to get out of that, that institutional mindset, I should right. say. Okay. And tell then us about, I went, tell us about your Wall Street capers now that you've got, you got involved in another way of making money very fast. Yeah, that's tell what us, I did. Tell was us I, about that. Then I, what I did was I stayed in Jersey for about a month. And you got that institutional mind. And then I went over to, I go back and I got to start making money. And uh, I didn't want to work. I didn't want an eight hour job. I didn't want to get up in the morning. I wanted on my time. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I went and bought a gun in the Bronx. I met this guy in the Bronx. And, uh, we started robbing people down on Wall Street, that he kind of turned me on to it. And um, I thought, you know, why am I splitting the money with this guy? You know, we could go on, you go on the other side of Wall Street, I could be on the other side of Wall Street. So what I started doing is, but he, he didn't go into it as much as I did. Like, he went down there in his street clothes. Well, I played the whole part. I went and put a suit on with a tie, with glasses, a briefcase. It actually looked like I was Wall Street. Right. Little to do you know until you came up on me. And if most people know, maybe I'll let know, probably knows. There is a lot of little streets down by Wall Street. The little alleys, brick roads, and that the people cut across. Like by Chambers Street and all that, or Wall Street, I should say, going down. So I, I can catch it in, in, in an alley, mostly in a real thin alley. They fairly deserted, look, Fred, or are they quite deserted, these little gunnels? Or? Well, it's three in the morning because they're going to Wall Street to do stocks. Yeah, yeah. So all these people are, are going and they're walking and they're not paying attention. They do not pay attention. That's the beauty of it. Here mm-hmm. you see me walking down the street in a tie, glasses. I mean, straight up, looked like I was a businessman mm-hmm. until you got next to me. Then I would shove you in the doorway, pistol whip you or make you get on the ground. And I would take your wallet, your rings, anything that you had of any. I didn't care. You know, I had people beg me not to bring the wedding rings. Well, you can't think that way. You've got to take it all. And you don't feel bad. The more you do it, the less you feel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I look back, I feel bad. And that, and, uh, then after that, I would go, uh, leave there. I go over to Brooklyn. I, I had a, a certain way I went. I went across the subway, went to Brooklyn, had breakfast. Uh, after I had breakfast, I come back to the house and change. Then I go, um, up to the, up the upper, upper, upper west side to this bar. And all you saw was the bartender. You go in there, order a drink, put your bag down, 
And that, nothing big, not, not like a big case, just like a brown paper bag wrapped up like he had a piece of salami in it or something. And you mm-hmm. set it on there, you take your drink, he would take it, and you never question it. And then I would come back the next day and I'd get an envelope. It could be anywhere from five grand to 20 grand. And then from there, that's when I went to Miami for like two or three weeks until my money was gone. And then I would come back and we started all over again. Wow, man. So really, that was a very, high, very highly, well, it's not that day, actually, what you were involved in before with the, uh, the Latino gang stuff and the, my, uh, the Cuban connection was a lot more dangerous than this in a way, wasn't it? It's well, yes, that's why I got out of it. That's what, it was becoming too dangerous for me in that point. Cause I mean, I've seen people shot, I've seen people killed, but this here was, it was my own, my own business kind of sort of speak. You know what I mean? I didn't mm-hmm. have to share the profits or anything. And it was quick and quiet. There was no scene where I had to come in, in with some other people and start breaking the place up or, or, you know, just those kind of things. This was quiet, done, one and done and go. And then I'd be gone for weeks. So really, this would all take place within the space of five minutes? Yeah, I'd be down in the Wall Street area. It'd take me longer to get to Wall Street than the, the robbery. And I, I only hit one robbery. I think people get greedy. That's when you get greedy, you get caught. So I would look for the guy that like, I'd look at his rings, his watches. When he came up close, I could tell his suit, Armani, or, you know, how well they were dressed, mm-hmm. you know, groomed. And that's how you picked, you picked them. You don't want some sloppy guy with the tie undone. He's Russian and everything like that. He's not organized. I want mm-hmm. the guy that's organized, you know, and that, and then I just, I'd take everything, everything you had. Then I would say, what stay was underneath. The reaction? What was the reaction of the, of the, of the people generally, Fred, to your, uh, your uh, interruption of their day? Me. Please don't kill me. Right. And I said, I won't unless you falter. Hmm. You falter, I'll shoot you. But, oh, you know, that's just a part of the game. I mean, it's, it's all, see, here's the thing when you do shit like this. It's all or nothing. There's nothing half-assed. If you do anything half-assed in these things, you're dead. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's times that I could have been dead. I mean, I was shot. I mean, you know what I mean? But the thing is, you just play with the game. And then I just, I guess I got tired of it. I guess it got older and older. And it was, it was wearing me out. It's too much. Were you drug, doing, much, say, were you doing roughly one robbery a day or more? Or it depends. Yeah, I could do one robbery a day unless I went to Miami with a gang of cash. Sometimes I'd stay up here, you know, in New York. And then, I, and then I'd go down to Miami. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but Miami was like, you know, New York was nice, but Miami had like all the, all the hot women, the weather, I mean, the coke, the, it had everything. Mm. And, that, and that's why I loved Miami. Well, what, a, wise, a wise man once said to me, if you're going to do the crime, make sure it's enough there to uh, change your lifestyle. If not, don't mess with it. I know, it, it, that's very true. Very true. I mean, if, it, if you're going to do the crime, man, do it right. Yeah. Don't do anything, you don't do shit half assed. Because you do it half-assed, you're screwed. And you can't let anybody into your game either. You know, it's it's a one-man deal here. And I try to make the most of what I could. But then, you know, it's, it's in the beginning, it's very, very um, energizing, uh, ad- adrenaline, and all those. But it does wear you out. It does wear you out. How if long you know are you doing coming. it roughly for, Fred? Fred, what kind of block of time are you doing this for, roughly? How long was I doing doing this? Yeah, at my crimes? A year, couple of years, or what? what you were just... uh shit. I mean, I was in New York for like 13, 14 years. I probably did my crimes like eight, eight, eight or nine years out of that fourteen. But you know, no one knew what I was doing. Like I'd go visit my aunt in Staten Island. That you never knew what I was doing. I always told them I had a job, like bottled water. I'd make up some bullshit stop. Oh, I'm working at a machine shop on Long Island in Deer Park or something like that. I never told anybody what I was doing. And because you don't, that's how you get caught. Because what happens when you brag and shit, they're going to catch on to you. Or mm-hmm. somebody's going to watch your game. Mm-hmm. So did you, you started to basically get sick of this too, didn't you? Started to yes. wear you out and you, um, you got fed up. Did you, did you think you were starting to get sloppy, Fred, or what? Or well, you no, know, that's what's happening. I was getting sloppy with the robberies. I was getting sloppy. Because I was thinking about doing two, which I knew I shouldn't have. I didn't pick my targets out correctly mm. as far as watching how they walk, their mannerisms and everything like that. Mm. You know, just I, I didn't look around 
You know, yeah. I got caught, almost got caught a few times by the police really, yeah. by early in the morning. And that was did anybody ever? Me. Did anybody ever pull a gun out to to try and? Or was that? No, you, you didn't have time for that. I didn't give you a chance for that. Right. I, there's no chance. You, by the time I was up on you, you was already on your knees. I get you. Yeah. You know, I know. I that was for sure. I, no, you got that the upper hand. Hmm. Did anybody yeah. ever witness you in the middle of the? Your, oh, it was uh, so fast. I, no, I threw you into a doorway or a dock. It was so, yeah. There was no cameras in them days. But it was so yeah. fast, and I tell him to keep your mouth shut. Just keep mm-hmm. your mouth shut. I put the, my thing, my feet right there down, and there's empty shit in there. There's empty at all. Everything. Rings, watches, everything. And mm-hmm. then if you didn't, I'd hit you with the gun. Mm-hmm. Or slap you or something. That's but I always an made incentive, sure, isn't it? Always made so, sure that. from then, Fred, you got sick of this this kind of particular aspect yes. of your lifestyle then. And you, you uh, is it true? Did you move to Jersey then and get an actual, get a straight job for a while or yes. a semi, yes. semi straight job for a while or? Yes, I did. I met a girl and you know, she wasn't a bar person. She wasn't a big drinker. No, but basically she wasn't a whore. <laughs> so, and you know, she, I really liked her in that, but you know, I can only tell her so much about myself. And then, you know, why do you have all this money and you don't have a job? Well, I go, no, I have a job. And, you know, I went and got a job. Yeah. Okay. You know. And um, so after this, what made you return to the Bay Area? What was it that, what was the impetus for you to go back? Uh, let's see. I, I moved to Philadelphia. I didn't like Philly. All right. And, that, and I was like, you know, I, I'm just tired of the East Coast. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. my mom had already passed away. My dad already passed away. Uh, so I wanted brother? to see my sister. Yeah, my brother OD'd in '96, but I already lived here. But my parents died in '79 and '80. Uh, my father died just before I went. And my mother died in '87. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. And then I came out, and then I, there's another thing. I I had a gang of money, and I paid everybody's funeral. And I remember my sister saying, "That's dirty money." I go, but I don't see anybody else paying, and I paid cash. I buried I buried both my parents and my brother by myself. I had a family, six kids. Which I was the black sheep, supposedly, but I didn't see anybody, you know, pulling up to the game saying, "I'll help you pay." And I paid what it all. Step, what about the stepbrother and the stepsisters you had? No, they, they had already left. They, they, they. No, their thing was, Fred, you're not married. You don't have a car. You don't have a garage, a house payment, or anything, so you mm-hmm. could afford it. That's oh, the right. case, but they didn't know it. But when I pulled out, like when I buried my mother in '87, I flew out. I had twenty grand in cash. I asked the, 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 the funeral director how much it was. He said 17,000. I pulled out 17,000. My sister was in awe. Like, where did you get the money? And my thing was, none of your business. It's being mm-hmm. paid for. There's no none bills. Paid it's paid. Yeah. You gotta remember, it's all done. It's paid. We're not making payments or anything. It's mm-hmm. done. So don't worry where the money came. Okay, Fred. So you're back in the Bay Area and you're back there about 1992, yeah? That yep. roughly 1992. How was your drug and alcohol use at that stage then? Were you still fueling yourself a lifestyle? Because you, it seems like you'd pulled out of the lifestyle to a degree. To a yeah, degree. to a degree. Oh, well, I got out of the crime scene. I didn't get out of the drinking or the blow scene. I got out of the crime scene. Okay. So when I got back here, my my um, use of cocaine and drinking just even escalated more and more. I was a functioning alcoholic, and I knew it. I just didn't want it. I didn't want to admit it, you know. Mm-hmm. I just didn't want to admit it, you know. And I knew it. I knew it. I mean, I had a great job. I was in the Sheet Metal Workers Union. So the Bonder Union here in, in uh, America, it's very hard to get to get fired. You had that grievance. Yeah. I mean, it's really hard. And you I mean, mean, you have I, to kill somebody to get fired, really? Or? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I'll give you this. In my, I was so bad in my drugs and drinking that I hadn't been to work in a week. And I went that week to pick up my check on Friday. And the guy said, what are you doing here, Fred? I said, to get paid. He goes, yeah, I haven't been here all week. That's how bad my drug and drinking were. I thought it was. Now I was mad at him because I wasn't getting the check. <laughs> Did you say to him, what day is it? What year is it? No, he asked me, do you know what day it is? I go, Friday, oh. payday. He goes, you haven't been here all week. The only day you remembered, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I didn't go to work for the whole week. You I thought I went. You said you're a functioning alcoholic. Now, by that, do you mean you're in the stage of alcoholism where perhaps 
you weren't experiencing blackouts yet. Were you experiencing blackouts? No, I, I had plenty of blackouts. Plenty of blackouts. Really? I you mean, never that was a big blackouts. red flag. Pardon you me? never had blackouts, is that right? No, I had pl- plenty. plenty. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I couldn't quite hear you. Yeah. Yeah, no, so I, I, I had you know, times of the day or night or evening where you didn't know where you were or what you'd done, yeah? Correct. All or right. how I got home or who she was or where yeah. I met her or where yeah. I was at in the city. I had a dealer that I could call, and he, and I always like to be by myself. I always like to drink by myself, not with a bunch of people. All right. Because I always pick up the ladies by myself and leave. Right. And this guy, the dealer, goes, Fred, man, you're all over the city. Everywhere I go, you know, all I do is call him, and he delivered because I spent money with him. I, I spent a lot of money with him. You know, I'd get an eight ball here, eight ball there, eight ball here. But he always delivered. I never had to go to a house. Now, for people that don't know, an eight ball is a, a mix of half. Coke, a Coke and smack, yeah? No, no, that's that's a speed, that's a speed ball. ball. Sorry, an eight, eight, ball. Eight, eight ball is three and a half grams. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and well, how much were they going for back then? Oh shit, like 90 bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 90 bucks to 140. Three and a half grams, that's pretty. Well, the more you bought, the cheaper it was, because a gram was a hundred. So it oh, could right. be anywhere from $90 to $150, depending who you got it from. And if mm. you, and if you went through a middleman, it was $300. Yeah, yeah. But see, I had the guy that delivered. I got to know him so well, he just delivered because <laughs> I did a lot of coke. So it wasn't like I was, I wasn't the weekend Coke guy. You know, like on Friday we'll party, get a half gram. I was constant. How much roughly Coke were you doing a day or a week, Fred, do you think? I was probably doing an eight ball a day, eight ball every two days, and then a quarter whiskey. Christ. A, a, a day. That's enough to make you quite antisocial. <laughs> oh, I was very social. I was Oh, loud. were you? Yeah, oh, right. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I didn't go, I didn't retreat. I was loud. Well, you are kind of, you, you've got a big personality, but that's, that's, for anybody who doesn't know, the, the United States for a while was, and maybe still is as far as I know, was completely awash. I mean, absolutely saturated to the max with cocaine in, in, into the 70s and then in, into the 80s. Did you, and from the musicians I've met and talked about and interviewed, did you get into the basing? Did you get into free basing? Yeah, free basing. I, I, I did, and it was a good high, but it was too much to cook. It's just like I, I did heroin once, same thing. It was I didn't like the, the the waiting game. Like I had to cook it, I had to strain it, I had to get all these components to get fucking high. Mm-hmm. I just I just wanted to snort it, and then free basing. You cook the coke. You know, it's basically crack. Is what crack is. It's yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yes. Right? yeah. So, but then what happens is you get in a room with a bunch of people and you just spun. You never go anywhere. You just spun out of your mind. Next, you know, the sun's coming up or you think it's someday. You think it's Monday and it's Tuesday. And I never, I never really got into that. I always like to do my bump, couple bumps of the blow and move on to the next bar, or next woman or, you know, just keep it going. I never got into that where you become in a, in a cave, a cave uh, high. Strong, strong, strong out for two or three days. I heard a story, I'm not going to mention any names, a guy told yeah. me about. He, he was living with his wife. He'd stayed married all the time. And uh, him and an, another pretty well-known cat from the uh, Latin rock scene in San Francisco. And they, the wife would say goodbye to him in the morning. Then she'd come <laughs> home from work in the evening. They were still at the table doing... Yeah, 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 yeah. And then she went out in the morning, and they were still fucking there. And she came home in the evening over two days, and they they were still there, just on a jag. You know, it's um, I don't think people realise the, the the obsessionality of that. There's almost well, a kind of a ritualistic part to it. Well, there's that obsessional yeah, but Coke beca- tunnel vision that happens. Coke, Coke became your girlfriend, right? Exactly. You took the Coke way before anything else. You know, yeah. whatever Coke. that blow was, you did. Hey, uh, Fred, Fred, do you remember a club called My Father's Place in Roslyn? I've been to Roslyn a few times, down there, Roslyn. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, wait, was, was it in that, um, was it in there like a complex? Yeah, you remember the little, Roslyn? it was the old village of Roslyn, you came down. Yeah, 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 it was in that complex that was yeah. in there. I used right? to man- I used yeah, to ma- yeah, yeah. I used to manage clubs down there in those days. Oh, okay, because I used to go down to Great Neck and Roslyn, uh-huh. right in that area. Yeah. And I remember when you just mentioned that. It was like a complex. 
down in Roslyn, but there were some bars in there. I think that's what yeah. Well, about. I used to do. I used to work with some pretty big guys down there, really big, big uh, artists. And um, uh-huh. I, you know, I'm talking about like guys. Who? Like um, who? Well, you name it, they played there. Dave Crosby, Hot Tuna, right. uh, um, oh, wow. uh, Miles Davis them. played there. Uh, um, uh, James mm-hmm. Brown, uh, Grandmaster Flash, everybody, everybody mm-hmm. played there, and. Um, I know guys who got paid that we paid them, and uh, they went out back and gave all the money to a dealer and um, freebase the rest yeah. of the night. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and these were yeah, really, yeah. and these were big artists. I remember doing a show with um, I did an HBO production with um, Jan and Dean. Remember them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Surf, yeah. surf kind of music. Yeah, 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 and. Um, oh, oh. They were they were like pre Beach Boys surf music, you know the Beach Boys right, kind of, right. yeah. yeah. And um, uh, Flo and Eddie were there, the Turtles. They did the MC work, and um, uh, mm. um, Jan Jan, who was the uh, mastermind behind the band until he um, had brain damage in a car accident. Oh Jesus! So anyway, he um, they kind of you know they kind of brought him out, and he he did his thing, and he you know whatever. But he was so, so messed up at the time that, um, yeah, all his money that was paid to him, he just blew it. He just blew it up, you know, and it was gone. And um, and it goes fast. goes fast. It goes fast. And, um, and yeah. you don't, like we say, you don't realize it, like the basin, they took all the money, put it out there. It went like that. It went like that. All well, the money was gone. But not only that, the same dealers travel around after you from city to city. Oh, yes. I mean, they go from state to state, knowing that you're going to be, you know, when you're getting money, when you're getting paid, and they're they're, wow. and they're, they're waiting because they probably fronted you, uh, you know, uh, uh, an eight ball or two, you know, before you got to where you're going. Yes. So they, they they want their money and they want to, you know, keep you going and they want to sell you some more stuff. And um, I saw huge, huge artists just um, leave town with no money in their pockets. Yeah. That, that that happens very frequent, more frequent than you think. Yeah, yeah. You know, you think it's the big game in the back, but so everybody's in the back and everybody's just getting high, and now then it's all gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, gone in yeah, it was it was actually uh, really really depressing. We actually had a room in the club that was uh, set up for um, rehab. <laughs> well, well, no, 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 no prehab. <laughs> prehab. <laughs> prehab. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, oh, and um, yeah, yeah, it was a, it, it was a nightmare. It really was. Yeah, Did you ever get into the stage, um, Elliot, or uh, not not Fred, but Elliot, that you kind of were acting as a kind of an agony art to these people, like you know, you know, uh, sort of saying. You, you, I, I you actually, know, really well, I actually spoke to Jan one night. You know, I was with him for about a week, and I Jan said to him, uh, "You know, isn't it enough?" I said, "You know," and he. And he probably, you know, he pretty much said to me, "Mind your own business," you know. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, you know, was, yeah, yeah, you know. And it was like, um, you know, mind your own business. I'm gonna do what I want to do. I, I, I deserve whatever, you know, because you, because at the time you thought you deserved that uh, high, that it was, uh, uh, um, mm-hmm. it was like your reward for working. And, and I mean, these were, mean, these were big guys. Read uh, Dave Crosby's life story. You know, read read. Oh, uh, big time Sausalito. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, he was. It wasn't just Sausalito. He, um, you know, he traveled uh, for a he year. He was an equal opportunity geographical user. Yeah. Yeah, but the whole thing was he. Um, <laughs> you know, he nobody would work with him. You know, Stills wouldn't yeah, work I with him. That. Nash wouldn't work with him. He was, you know. Then he finally went to jail, and I think in Texas, right? Was he in Texas? Yeah, Texas. Yeah, Texas. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you know, I've got to say, I find him one of the most overrated fuckers in the business. Whatever, you? yeah, but whatever it is, he um, he blew whatever fo- it is. he blew fortunes, you know. And oh, he had it. Yeah, and, and he worked hard to get where he was, even though you know he might have been overrated. But he did his stint in the birds. He did his thing. Crosby, oh, Stills, Nash. You know, we used to, uh, you know, we used to joke around. You know, there's um, bootleg tapes of Crosby, Stills, and Nash fighting in the dressing room. You know, it was, uh, they, they were always, you know, they were always fighting. But um, you know, it, he uh, nobody worked with him. They, they, they kind of uh, nobody could help him. I blackballed so, him. Yeah. So you know, Coke, Coke was your girlfriend. I mean, that was, as opposed to eight, eight balled him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, so Coke, yeah, he Coke, 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 and whoever did Coke at the end carried a gun. 
Right? You better believe it. Right, Fred? Everybody carried a gun because you started getting paranoid. Right. You started getting paranoid. Yeah, so exactly. it, it was a dirty, dirty little mix there. Then I went on to um, the Meadowlands. I used to manage part of the Meadowlands. Oh, yeah, you told me that. Yeah. And there you saw some real nightmares. What do you mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, the I bigger fat. I mean, you, I saw, you, you, saw, you saw eight balls sitting on tables that were part of the uh, rider, you know, part of the contract to work All right. yeah, well yeah that's what they did like I want this set of cheese I want this kind of drink and a couple eight balls yeah. and put them over here yeah. you know it was just part of put it by the punch yeah <laughs> yeah 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 and um, did it make did it did cocaine at that level do you think it made people very OCD yeah not, yeah. O, not, o, not, not OCD as much as paranoid you know it kind of no, looks more, more paranoid you yeah. mean they were paranoid in a very tidy way no, paranoid in a very sloppy way. Oh, very right. sloppy way. Yeah, you. I the mean, more you did, the more intense it got. Yeah. The more intense it got, and then you started like being like a little beady guy, like looking around everything. It was it was horrible. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, horrible. yeah, yeah. Is the room bugged? Are the bugs in the room? Uh, you know, who's listening to me? Um, uh, yeah. Crazy shit. I know I'm supposed you to be in this room. I know I'm supposed to be in dressing room B, but um, I think it's bugged. You know, I think they're listening. Uh, they, they, they know I'm going to be put, put, put me put me in D. Put me in dressing room B. And don't tell anybody where. Don't tell anybody where I am and wait and get me ten minutes before I'm supposed to be on stage. That kind of thing. <laughs> That's how it works exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I lived through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, then, then we, we we would do shows in the smaller clubs, and um, the collectors would be waiting for the artist to get there to break a kneecap or something, you know. So that's why that's why the artist didn't show up to play. They knew people were looking for him, so you'd book and act in, and they wouldn't come because they knew people knew where they were going to be because you. Um, or, or you would book an act, and they'd say, "Don't advertise this until the day of the show." Right? How, how the hell are you going to do a show and not advertise it? Well, don't advertise it because the people are going to come looking for me, and I'm not going to be able to show up anyway. So don't advertise it. <laughs> <laughs> did you try and did you ever try and book Sly Stone? Because yes, was, uh, and he never showed up. No, I'll tell you. I have a story. He was down here in San Jose in the uh, '70s. He was so loaded in coke out of his mind. Yep. That he came up, he did one song, mm -hmm. right, and got back in his Mercedes and split. And it was hot outside. It was like one of the last acts. The guy was so lipped up on coke that he got in, got back his car and left. Yeah, that was yeah, it. That was yeah. his show. That like, was his um, show. I put, value you know, for mo value for money. Yeah, and the whole uh, thing is, yeah. and uh, um, um, Iggy Pop used to pull that too. Iggy wouldn't show. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Iggy Pop. <laughs> I mean, you know, he, people suffered from migraines. They said, "Thank God." Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, hey, Fred, Fred, let's um, we're having a laugh about this, but there's no way of quantifying or even coming to terms with. I wonder how much corruption, crime, rape, gunplay, destruction, and general mayhem coke's caused in the states because. There's no doubt that that drug has caused fucking mayhem, isn't it, really? Oh, the it's destroyed, it's destroyed family, that, everything. You know, people, creativity, and, and bands splitting up because of it, you know, uh, you know, and, and artists. Well, yeah, bands split up because one thinks he's better than the other, and, you know, you guy, I started the band, and, you know, it's just the coke thing and the drug scene, it's ruined a lot of people. A lot oh, of yeah. bands, a lot of lives, a lot of families. And that, and you know, I, I, as I got older, I started to see this, you know, mm -hmm. and that, and that, I, I just got tired of it. And like, I like, it was like, you know, I, I have eight years now, you know, of a sobriety. And Before shit, we and go that, to that, Fred, there's an interesting story that I know about you, which is you were basically probably out there for 20 years or more using and drinking. You oh, know, easily. You know, easily. Easy. Yeah. You saw people dying and that's not enough. In most people's cases, to stop, they ain't gonna, people ain't gonna stop on knowledge like that. But you, people that kind of get into what we call recovery, they have something called a rock bottom. You can have a few of those, but then you get to a rock bottom. Well, Tell us about your rock bottom, Fred. What you saw, how you felt, and what happened, please. Okay, um, 
I had a best friend of over 50 years. You know, he always, he never ventured any. He was out, I, I was a binge drinker, you know, and he was more of a bar drinker, you know, right. early in the morning. But I was friends with 50 years of that and it just got worse and worse. Our relationships got worse. Uh, you know, and what happened was, um, his daughter called me and told me he died and that was in uh, 2012. Right. And I was kind of devastated. Like, man, how could he have died on me? You know, I mean, we, you just, you think you're invincible at this point. And yeah. what happened was, um, we couldn't get him out of the morgue because he was divorced and his kids were under 18 and his parents were, di- his parents had died, but I knew he had an aunt in Washington and I did find her. It took mm-hmm. me a while, for like 10 days. But I did mm-hmm. find her and said that Brad had passed away and I need to get him out. I need a, a document for you to sign so I can get him out of there. Right. Well, as I went down there, I got the document. I went to go, go identify him. I called the place up. I said, you know, my friend mother, I'm, I'm Brad's best friend. You know, I got all this mm-hmm. information. Mm-hmm. And he goes, okay. So we walked into it. And I remember it was a very foggy morning. This, this was south of San Francisco in a town of San Carlos. And what mm-hmm. really got me was it was an industrial park. It wasn't like a morgue. It was a morgue, but it was an industrial mm-hmm. park. You would never mm-hmm. know this place was there. And yeah. I thought that was like, oh man, it's like a parts department. So as I walked in, he goes, yeah, I'll pull him out of the refrigerator. And I'm, you know, I'm, I've seen a lot and stuff. So I didn't really think it was going to bother me. Mm. So he pulled him out. And when he pulled that sheet across from him, he looked like a little, I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. He looked like a little old man. He, wow. I only knew him by his nose because he was Italian and he had a tattoo. Otherwise, I probably might have identified him. Wow. But as I looked at him, I looked up to shake in my head. And I remember tears coming down my cheeks. I mm-hmm. looked back down and I saw myself on the gurney. I saw myself in that mm-hmm. ash colored thing. And I heard a voice say, you're next. It was an epiphany. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Frank, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then uh, it was an epiphany. And I, I was just devastated. And what got me was I walked out of there. It was clear blue skies. It was in the afternoon. I can't tell you how long I was in there. It had to be hours. It had to be hours. Because I got there at 8.30. And then now it was after 12, I guess. And it was this beautiful out. Sunny skies, everything. And I said to myself, I'm done. I'm done drinking. I went to my girlfriend's house. Amazing. And I told her, Irish girl. And we, there wasn't any relationship. It was mostly that, like sex and, and drinking and, you know. Yeah, yeah. We really never, every time we went out to dinner, we never made dinner. You know, we stopped at the bar first. And I remember telling her, I, I said, I just identified Brad and I quit drinking and she laughed. She goes, oh, that'll be the day because she knew how much I drank. Yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, I went home and I was really mad that she said that. And, uh, I said, you know, screw this. I'm, I went back down there, knocked on the door and she said, well, why don't you come in? I go, cause we're done. You know, you, you, um, you laughed at me. You know, you didn't think I could do this. And I haven't touched a drink since. And then I became an artist. How, how long ago was that? Uh, 2012, of December 27th, 2012 wow. is my date. Good for you. Day at a time, then, day at time man. Yeah. And then I, uh, then I started, uh, I had to keep my hands busy from drinking, from picking up a Coke spoon or drinking. So I got into art and I don't know anything about art. Nothing. Zero. I couldn't even draw you a stick, man. So I just got, just got a canvas and stuff and I started doing abstract art with just mm-hmm. my colors and what I thought. And mm-hmm. uh, how it started was this woman walked by my house and asked if I sold my art. I, and she goes, I'll give you 500 for it. And it was a 24 by 24. I couldn't believe she was giving me $500 for this, <laughs> this put paint on it. I couldn't believe it. But she came back and actually bought it. Then she brought a friend later on and bought another piece of 400. And that's how I started. And now it, it kind of slowed off, but I, I stuck with it. I watched video after video on YouTube of different art, abstract art, mm-hmm. and different mm-hmm. styles. And mm-hmm. uh, now I'm, I'm on my seventh year. I'm eight years clean and sober. And now I got seven years painting. And just last week I sold eight paintings. Hey, uh, not, so it's, it's, it's my arts, it, it, it solidly exploded. And I'm starting to get the name around the neighborhood from North Beach. It's a very artsy area. Mm. And uh my friends are just uh, aghast that I'm even an artist. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then you know, I just like I'm still the artist. But don't mistake my kindness for weakness either. 
Mm. I look at it that way. I'm always on the fence there. But yeah, I've yeah. always been like that. But for but, anybody but, listening, for anybody listening to this, really what you just heard is something that I've experienced myself in a different way to Fred. But what you've just heard really is, is what I would call the, the modern day miracle really. You've just heard a miracle that the reason why we went into so much depth about your life, Fred, is that you lived pretty tough, pretty close to the edge and you had to do stuff. We well, didn't have to do it, but you wanted to do stuff that was, um, you know, pretty outrageous. You had to prove yourself in certain ways. The fact that you now are doing something which is so different to that and you've, you've made such a 360 degree life change. And, you know, I've met your, uh, I haven't met your wife, but I've spoken to your wife and she's a lovely darling wife you've got. I mean, people don't understand what it's like, you know, from what I've heard, Fred, it's only like 5% of people that make it really, you know. Yeah, there's Lots only five. Of, a matter know, of, they matter, get out of that life, you know. A matter of fact, I'm speaking, uh, this, this on the 8th for my old group. And that's mm-hmm. another thing. I mean, I was a womanizer. My wife is the first woman that I've ever been, uh, uh, loyal to. Mm-hmm. And she's a great girl and I met her through Eddie and uh, she's not a drinker. She has a glass of wine, but I, which I call a normie. But I mean, I'm married for the first time at 60 years old. I mean, I was never married. She was never married. But this first time and we get along great. We have good laughs and everything mm-hmm. like that. But she's different than any, I'm not trying to manipulate her. That was the problem. I manipulated mm-hmm. women. And yeah. she's just a great, great girl. I'm very blessed to have met her and married her. Then she married me. You know, mm-hmm. her father was an artist and I, I never yes. held back anything with his father. I told her father everything about me. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm marrying his daughter and I have a daughter. And if somebody's married, her, I'm going to want to know about you or I'm going to find out about you. Mm-hmm. That's how I look at it. So I have to be honest. And that's what taught me in this program is I have a uh, integrity tattooed across the top of my chest under my collar. Here. And that's mm-hmm. to remind me to be honest with myself and honest with others at all time. No matter mm-hmm. what the circumstances, you might not like it, but be honest. Because mm-hmm. if you're not honest, you're not getting anywhere. Yeah. And that's how I look. That's my motto. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm straight forward. You know that. I tell you, yeah, like, yeah. you might not like what I say, but you know what? I don't hide anything. I, you know, I don't guess anything. I tell you what I feel, how I feel. And it's either like they don't, but you got to look at this way too. You, I'm not a uh, people pleaser, but nobody can people please everybody. There's going to be people that don't like you. And that's just the way it is. And you got to accept you're, that. You're powerless over whether people like you or not. I get, you know, either you like me or don't, I don't care. I, and yeah. I will treat you respect. You treat me with respect. Bottom line. Mm-hmm. That's how I look at well, it. One of the things I've noticed, Fred, is, is, um, over the years, because I've been, you know, last 10, 12 years been involved writing kind of, music related books is the guys I've met sometimes, not just the guys or the women that have kind of used a lot of coke in the past or a lot of drugs and a lot of drinking or whatever. The ones that don't have the recovery program, they seem kind of a bit fu- kind of fucked in the head to me in a way, in a sense that, that we are too, but in, in a sense, they don't have that kind of like, they haven't kind of unscrambled, unpicked some of the damage, you know, or the psychological issues that have come up or, well, they haven't we taken maybe even do it, you know. Yeah, but you have to dig in deep and and and, and, and um, know about yourself. You know, they don't want to let it down because it's painful. These things that you you let out that you swear you go to the grave with, you know, mm-hmm. they're very painful things in your life. In that, and they don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. You have to do. You you have to study yourself and, and, and see you know what the problem is. You know what the problem is, but what are you going to do about it? In order yeah. to stay in sobriety. You have to take action. Like I'm speaking next week, right? Even though we're in the COVID, we got social distancing. Mm-hmm. It's outside and I'll be up in the front, but I'm happy to do it if I could help just one person because I know the misery of, 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 of the alcohol or the drug addict. It's miserable. Mm-hmm. You think you got it all together. You don't got shit together yeah. until you find out who you really are. You're not mm-hmm. trying to be somebody you want to be like, don't want a tough guy. But, you know, you're just happy in your own skin, which most addicts are not. You're not happy yeah, in your own skin. Right, yeah, that's right. And if you become that part of that group of being happy with yourself or you're good with your skin and that, then, mm. then you can make it. You're going to make it. But for me, it's a day to time. Yeah. I don't look – like I said, I have eight years. I have eight years in, in, in December, 27. Well, I'm not there yet. Mm. Anything could happen. So I just stay on the straight and narrow. 
Yep. And, yep. you know, like she has friends that drink and that, I have boundaries. You just got to put boundaries on yourself. It's a whole different thing. But I've yeah. never been happier in my life. I'm spread free. I, I got to see you in the UK. I got to travel to all those countries. What yeah. I always talked about, Germany, uh, Amsterdam, London, Paris, you know, yeah. Brussels. I would those always talked about in the bar, the bar stories. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I actually took action. Mm-hmm. And then my eight years, I believe I've lived my whole life in eight years yeah. of good life, of a good life. And it continues to be a good life. I have I'm a wonderful life. wife. She's yeah. great. Mm-hmm. You know, couldn't ask better. Right. Yeah. I mean, my you've daughter, got a you really have you and you treat, you treat the people around you well, but as you say, you don't take no shit. You're definitely a kind of real person in that. I mean, going back to the, you know, talking about bar stories. I mean, my favorite of those is, uh, you know, the two alcoholics sitting in a bar and one says, I'm writing a book. And the other one says, nor am I. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like all, yes. that fucking, all that fucking fantasy that's indulged in, you know, like I'm oh, doing yeah. this, I'm doing that. And it's like, no, you're not. Shut up. You, you embellish everything. Doing fuck all, you know. Everything's in bed. Okay, time. You know. <laughs> mm. Well, for me, Fred, I'm really glad I met you. You know, we've had some real laughs. We've had some talks. Oh, I had a great time visiting you over there. I had a great time. Yeah, Elliot, did you? Are we playing? I don't. It looks like we ain't playing any of Fred's four tunes, no. I thought we'd do them karaoke style. Uh, <laughs> so get Fred to sing them. Yes. Can you do con- constant craving, Fred? For us, acapella. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we? Have we got a constant craving there? Why don't we? Yeah. Play out. With well, I that? like that I song. Mean, it's a great song, Fred. Are, are we done now, or that's it? Well, I mean, Fred's really brought it to a place. I think that's amazing. You know, he's kind of taken it to where he had a breakthrough in life, a miracle. You know, and I really do believe Fred is a miracle. You know. Thank you. Know, he's a I believe dog. that myself. Yeah. Huh? You agreeing with Watch Fred or what? I'm no, agreeing. Yeah, no, I, I said I, 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 I agree. <laughs> no, I'm agreeing with you. Dad, I don't tell me what to do. Hey, Fred. <laughs> Fred, I was I was I was on Wall Street once, and somebody took my watch and wallet. Was that you? Could have been. Was it the mid eighties? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. I gave it back to you. It yeah, was yeah. I remember. Yeah, it was, I remember. It was, it, was a, it was a Timex. Yeah, it was. It was. A, it was a real good looking. It was a real good looking guy in a suit and tie. He had an attaché case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he, he smelled. Did he smell slightly uh, like he'd been drinking early in the morning? Though. No, oh no. no, I no no. I had cologne, man. I had the cologne. Go. Huh? <laughs> no, I I covered that with cologne. There you go. Right. Cologne. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he sm- smelled like a French whore. <laughs> What's that smell in the alley? That's me, baby. Yeah, yeah. Pe- Pepe Le Pew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, well, let's let's, uh, let's uh, Fred. It's been absolutely fantastic. How long have we been talking for? Uh, let's see. We have a, a good yeah, hour, was, a good hour and a half. Yeah, really? a good hour and a half. Yeah. I can't take any more, uh, Elliot. No. He's going to take you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got to go and lie down in a darkened room now. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> with an eight ball. With an eight ball. Yeah, with an eight yeah. and, bo- and a bottle of scotch. <laughs> <laughs> no way, no way hose B. Yeah. No hose B. Well, um, listen, Fred, I'll speak to you soon, brother, and um, thank you yes. for giving us your time and your uh, your experience. And, and strength thank you for having me. And your hope and... Uh, Really great. I really enjoyed that. It's very. That was very encouraging. Very. No, it was a uh, great, great story. I mean, it's a, you know, it's it's. Um, Thank you. I mean, it's. You're lucky to be alive, brother. I'd say that. So I can say that I, I count my blessings every day with that because I have my daughter, mm-hmm. and uh, she knows all about me. I never had anything from my daughter. Not your mother's radio is listener funded. If you wish to assist and help keep the station active, funds can be sent via PayPal to Elliot is not your mother at gmail.com remember there is one l in elliot thank you for your assistance it is appreciated